to Hermit Woods, where there's a story in every bottle. Look at that. How about that? There's, there's wine in the glass. We're starting already. This way. We didn't even wait for the audience. No. We just no, poured we it in the glass. Yeah. <laughs> you know, cheers. And, <laughs> cheers. <laughs> Again. I like this. We, we got to be good. more planful about this in the future. This, this works. Yeah. You know, put a corkscrew and a bottle in front of me. I'll, I'll we'll just open it up. <laughs> so, hello, cheers, everyone. Welcome, Welcome to yet another, another Monday of our uh, Monday Night Live. Mm. And uh, today, is our, it's our third Monday of the month, which every Monday, every third Monday of the month, we dedicate to a wine tasting. A virtual wine a tasting. A virtual wine tasting. Even though we're not virtually tasting it. No, we, we are literally goodness, tasting it. <laughs> <laughs> but you, too, could literally be tasting it because we, we, we put out on our website which wines we're going to taste every third Monday of the month. And if you wanted to get those wines and have them available for you and your friends, to be at home with us, tasting the same wines as we are, you can order those those wines online, or you can order the, or pick them up at the tasting room. So and this is so us. this is mapped out way in the future. So it's like a, next month is is, is next already month on the is website. Already planned. I believe next yeah. month is a is a selection of dessert wines. Oh, um, now we haven't I gone I, I, past that. Reminds yet. me, we're going to go okay. past that. So okay. we'll we'll put October's in. Yeah, November's we'll stay ahead wines. of it. Yeah. To, to make sure that everybody can get get we'll, the wines. We'll try. Yeah, we'll try anyway. <laughs> But, but today is mead. some mead. mead. We're talking about yes. mead. Yeah. Yes. We don't talk as, as much about mead. We talk about a lot of our other wines. But, but meads, I think, are a really important part of our selection of wines. But, you know, it's interesting. We have about as many meads as we have other wines. Right. But we don't sell nearly as many meads as we do wines. And so, I think it's because it is one of those unique beverages that you sort of have to acclimate to and get used to. And, and for some people, they just don't care for the, the characteristics of fermented honey. It is unique. So here's another reason. So in the world of the alcohol business, sort of the big broad picture of the alcohol yeah. world, 60% of all alcohol sold in America is in the form of spirits. Spirits. Okay. <laughs> then Go right to the ethanol. Yeah. So then yeah. the next segment of sales 30% of what Americans consume, well, it's like that beer can what? over what? there. No, no, Ooh, sorry, what? no, a beer, right? A beer. beer yeah. So, <laughs> and then that leaves 10% in the world out there for wine. For wine. And, and that, mead is a very small fraction. It's, it's like, chinking in, though. The last five, eight, ten years, it's made it seems to have really grown. And then cider has cider. also chinked into that, both in the beer and the wine world, probably. So, so interestingly, on the contrary to everything I just said, mead and cider are the two fastest growing segments of the alcohol ah, industry. Interesting. But you still have to keep that in mind, perspective-wise. Yeah. It's still a, a very, drop. very, it's a, it's, a, it's a fraction of a percent of the amount of alcohol consumed in the wine world. But you know... But that's a lot. When there's 300 million people in the world, a fraction of a percent is a, right. lot of, a lot that's of right. mead. That's right. You know... Um, Think back just 15, 20 years ago, craft brewing really didn't exist. There were home brewers. There were a right. couple like Anchor Steam and a few others that were making craft beers, but it was dominated by Budweiser and Coors oh, and, and all of those. And it still and is. Then it, it still is, but the, the craft brewing scene ate into their market enough to where they started buying craft Breweries, right, Goose right. Island, and so this and is another statistic though that fascinates me: the craft beer industry, which includes very large producers like Dogfish Head, yep. Sa uh, Sam, Sam Adams, Adams yep. 
Um, there's there's a number of very large producers, even Sierra Nevada, right? Yep. All of these big producers combined with all of the small producers that you all know yep. on your on your block or your corner, of them. represents only eight percent of the beer sold in the U.S. Eight percent. Eight percent. Eight percent of that thirty. No, eight percent of the thirty. There's ninety. Yeah. 2% of all beer sold is sold by Budweiser, Miller Lite, and the, the big national the big brands. Ones. Yeah. So even though craft beverages is taken off and everybody thinks, wow, we all know about craft beverage, it's still a very, very small segment of the market. So it's really fascinating. Yeah. And I think, yeah. I think it, the same would hold true. Hermit Woods and the wines that we produce are also a very small segment of, the, of that 10% well, of wine. But business. USA Today just made a comment about it. So this is a did. national paper box. They about did. our tasting experience that might expose us to a few more people that have never heard of Permit Woods. So uh, we have to we have a big shout out to everybody out there who's yes, watching thank you us all. and anybody else who, who's not watching us who helped support us by voting for us. Over the month of July, we, we were voting for who is going to be one of the top 10 tasting rooms in the U.S. And Hermit Woods, because of all of you and all of our friends, uh, we ended up being number four in the country which is, is mind-blowing. It is mind-blowing. We, we have it's such phenomenal. great competition out there. I've been to wine tasting experiences all over the country. And, and you know what? From the day we started this winery, that was one of the most important things to me. Right. That we no, I know. You, you, really, you really, really have focused on this, and, and, it's, and it's really fantastic. I mean, Bob, Bob is the vision and the leader of the whole tasting experience here. It is your, your thing, and it's fantastic. Well, and it's well deserved. Combined well with your deserved. wine. No, but it's the tasting of a great magic. Here. It, it is a wonderful <laughs> magic. And we get to drink sometimes. So let's take a, a, a second to actually check, check with our in audience. Good. And, I'm going to um, turn off the music here, too, here. in the background. You can leave it on. I think it's not. Um, I don't think it's good. Okay. Okay. It's The great. microphones are pretty grabbing our sound here. Okay, so. good. And we, have some, we have a live audience. Today. I know. We do. Yes, they're enjoying some beer and wines out yeah. there. Yeah, so we don't want to turn the music off because that no, would change their that's experience. True. We remember best tasting room in America. They got to be able to have some nice music. It is the number one goal. So uh, we got a few people on with us. Let's see who's Excellent. joined us. We already got some comments. So before I go into the comments, I just want to say, as I do every week, if you're joining us for the first time, we'd love it if you'd like our page. If you're on Facebook, there's a little bell. Click that bell and you will be subscribed to our Facebook page. And every time we go live, you'll get a notice that Hermit Woods is live and you can join in and participate. Um, if you're on YouTube, you can, let's right, see, right, right over here is a subscribe <laughs> button, and you can subscribe to our page, and you'll also be notified when we go live to, to, to the world. So uh, do that, please. And if you like what we're doing, like the broadcast, share it with your friends if you think you have friends that might enjoy what we have to say. And, uh, and if, you have, if, you're, if you're joining us, please say hi. As several of you have already said hi. Thank you for that. And uh, let us know that you're here because we won't know unless you make a comment. And, uh, and if you have questions, we will do our best to get to your questions and share them with the audience and answer them on the air. Um, if we don't get them on the air, uh, rest assured, we will get to your questions at the end of the broadcast. So there it is. That's done with all the details. Good. What do we so got on here? We got a bunch of nice, nice people here today. Matt, of course, thank you, Matt, for joining us. Excellent, Matt. And uh, Matt, uh, wish me a happy birthday. Thank you, Matt. We. Uh, I really appreciate that. It was my birthday yesterday, if, if, if you didn't know, and uh, and uh, a lot of you chimed in to say hello, and I really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Uh, Janice is there. Beautiful Monday afternoon. Excellent. Uh, Douglas Peterson. Excellent. Uh, I haven't seen Douglas on here before. Yes. So Douglas is here. Lynn's here. Lynn. Excellent. And uh, and. Ward Hobson. Hi, and good evening, everyone. Ward, I haven't seen you here either. Oh, actually, I think Ward was here. Yes. From, uh, she's from Nebraska or somewhere in the Midwest. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yes, she was she here last week. So good that's to right. see you back. Thank you for joining us. And uh, Douglas wants to let us know that he totally loves the Red Scare. Well, we're going to go into the Red Scare I again totally today. I love the Red Scare, too. I, that's one of my that's one a, of my favorites. Yeah, that's a that's a, yeah. that's a really yes. important wine here. Yeah. So you you have good taste there, Doug. And uh, Lynn, uh, honeycomb for tonight's show. Um, she's trying honeycomb. Oh, she's got honeycomb. She's got honeycomb. Excellent. Nice. Oh, I that. love that. That's that's a one off, never happen again type of thing. Yeah. So let's see. 
Janice says congratulations. Excellent. Gary's here. Good to see you, Gary. We Excellent. saw you, Gary. I saw Gary. I got to sit with Gary uh, and Paula in the in the garden uh, Sunday afternoon. Oh, good. We I saw him just just when I was leaving on Sunday, uh, taking Mindy home after assembling some wine. Well, they went yeah. from the winery over to the to the garden yeah, and uh, had some food and some and we got to sit together. So it was great to see you guys. Right. Glad we got a few minutes right. together. Although work called and I had to get pulled away, but that's okay. And uh, let's see, that's it. That's it. That's it right now for comments. Any comments and questions? So please, please let us know. We will. Uh, we'll do our best. I was to surprised get to not to see Priscilla chime again. Yeah, because, you know it was great. Know, Priscilla shows up on the show. So last just about week, every week. Yeah. yeah. Last week, Priscilla, uh, she probably show up. She always does. Yes. Uh, we were picking rose hips down at the at the ocean side last week, as many of you know, and uh, and lo and behold. Here, this woman a bicyclist comes riding up on a bike, and it's there. It is. It's Priscilla, and she said hi to all of us, and, uh, <laughs> and we had awesome. a great conversation. That yeah, was great. I, I'm not sure. It might have been random, but she knew we were going to be there. But how did she know where we were going to be? Yeah. And she drives. She she lives inland a ways, but she drives out to the yeah. beach to ride. She really enjoys yeah. riding out well, there. It's great seeing you, Priscilla. Yeah. If you do see this, this oh, Geraldine popped on too. Of course, she did. Well, I can't me. imagine. We're drinking. Gerilyn, Gerilyn, I'm three sorry. Um, the three honey may go down. We, uh, yeah, it's not looking good sorry. for bringing any three honey <laughs> home tonight. Maybe I'll just have to grab a yeah, bottle. Yeah, have to grab a different <laughs> bottle. <laughs> so I, I love this 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 wine. It's just such a. Um, it's a unique thing. So so for those of you out there, mead is made out of honey, and honey is this wonderful magical material. Um, it's gathered by, by bees, by honeybees. They collect the nectar out of flowers and they actually ingest it and mix it with some of their enzymes and then regurgitate that back up into the honeycomb. A little maybe, maybe too much information here, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's not vegan in that way. It is an animal product mm -hmm. in some ways and some vegan uh, people who choose not to eat animal products uh, can be referred to as vegan when they include honey in their diet. So my daughter Liana was strictly vegan for a while, but now she's vegan because she she's will vegan, eat okay. honey. Um, it's it's fascinating. It takes five thousand bees going to flowers collecting nectar to make one teaspoon of honey. <laughs> So this <laughs> jar is millions of bees flying to individual flowers, collecting that nectar, bringing it back to the beehive, putting it into their honeycomb. And then the beehive acts like a dehydrator. They remove the water out of the honey until it reaches a certain point, usually 19 or 20% residual water in the honey. And at that point, this material is shelf stable at room temperature forever. You can leave the lid off, open, on the counter, forever. They've recovered honey out of Egyptian hives, out of Egyptian uh, mummy yep. settings. That's it's still, still fine. edible. Yeah, it's still fine. It's full of antibacterial uh, properties. Uh, throughout the centuries, people use this as, a, as an antibiotic salve. If you have an open wound, you can put honey on it, and it'll it'll heal it faster than a triple antibiotic that you buy at the drugstore. That's amazing. So, and and I and since we've been doing this together, I've learned so much more about honey and everything else we're doing. It is, and that's kind of what is so much fun about this journey. But honey, more than probably any other thing that we're dealing with, um, the the one of the most amazing things about honey is. There are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of varieties of oh, yeah. honey. Oh, and you never yes. knew that. You know, when I was a kid, and I'd buy honey. In yeah, a it's little, honey. Comes in, in a little, little squeeze squeeze jar. A the, bear. Yeah, the little honey little bear. Bear. Right. Yeah, and which squeeze actually, it out if you're your... getting honey in a supermarket in a bear, you're probably not getting honey. Which yeah, is some kind of it of actually sad. has corn syrup. I cooked yeah, corn it's, syrup in it's, it. It's, yeah, it's not pure. And honey. even if it is honey, it's been so highly processed that anything natural about it has been removed from it. So, but what I started to learn as I dug into honey and getting to know you and, and your keeping hives is peop, uh, beekeepers or apiaries target flowers. So you can target yes. Yes. any flower. Yes. So there's that, 
the, the, the limits of that are infinite. There are so many different yeah. flowers out there in the world and you can target them and you can get honey and collect it from a very specific flower. And each one is going to taste, taste different. different. Yeah. That's amazing yeah. to it me. Is, it, is, it is one of the really magical things about honey is it really captures the diversity of the, the flower the environment. Talk in about your, terroir. Your Talk about terroir. This, yeah. this is it. This so, is and and it changes during the season as different flowers come out. Right. You know, three months ago we had apple blossoms so and pear blossom and peach blossoms all yeah. over the place, and now we have goldenrod and Japanese knotweed and other flowers, and we've had lots of things in between. Corn. There have been so many different things that were that are flowering that honey changes during the season. So interesting. Most honeys are a field blend. Yes. <laughs> right? They're sure. a collection of this all is, different This flowers. is a wildflower honey. It's a field blend. It's a blend. Yeah. Because it's very hard to separate it. There are um, hives that are put in certain areas that are in close proximity to flowering plants. And people do this, um, agricultural folks, people who are growing <laughs> blueberries or they're growing peaches or they're growing apricots. They will hire someone to bring in beehives and set them up in their For orchard that, to target that to flower. pollinate, and they're they're doing it to pollinate, oh, it to pollinate all right. of it to get better fruit set. Right, they get a higher yield off of their trees because all of the flowers are visited by pollinators. Right, the resulting honey is strongly driven towards that particular flower, and you get uh, orange blossom or Tupelo honey, or Japanese knotweed honey, yeah, or, or yeah. things like that, wild blueberry honey. So when Geraldine and I were in France, we walked into oh, a, yeah, to a like honey store. store, which is in French has it has a name to it. I forget what the, the French name for it is, but hmm. it was a store, an entire store dedicated to honey, and all the walls were covered in honey jars, and, and on the front desk was a, was a, a display of maybe 100, maybe not that many, but a lot, maybe 50, different honeys in little cups and they would give you a toothpick and you could dip it into <laughs> whichever honey it. and you could sample all of these and they were so different each one had its own special characteristics so uh that was that was a great experience i learned a lot that day and yeah. i've learned since a lot more since working with you uh making meads and and working with the apiaries that we've worked with and and i've become a huge fan of honey i keep keep honey at home i go through it like by the gallon <laughs> on my toast in my in my tea yes. and in various other ways so uh honey's a great thing great so thing. a little shout out here to hall oh, apiaries, apiaries. Yeah. so uh troy hall uh runs hall apiaries it's over in the western portion of the state just south of uh white river junction yep and um troy is a bee whisperer watching him when He's i go all out all over the, new england he is. He's yeah. really a fantastic guy, and he has hundreds of hives. He started off learning how to take care of bees over in Vermont and then set up his own place in New Hampshire. And um, I used to source honey from a few different suppliers, but I've really focused on Troy's. I love his, his honey and, and supporting him. We sell the, the honey in the jars. Uh, you and I eat it at home all the time, and it goes into making our meads. So literally mead is a combination of honey, which is incredibly packed full of sugar, high sugar component. When putting this in the context of, of the wine world with grapes, you know, a, a good high sugar uh, Merlot or Cabernet may be 24 bricks or 26 bricks. And that's a measure of the, the sugar level. And honey is like 85 bricks. It's way, way too sweet. sweet. Yeah. Way too sweet. You couldn't which even is, ferment that. Yeast which is why you in. can't ferment this. That's right. Which is why you can leave this open on the counter. Yeast won't be able to ferment that. There's yeast in honey, natural honey. But they can't do anything about but it. They can't do anything unless it gets diluted. Right. And the oldest known alcoholic beverage is uh, from honey. And 9,000 years ago. 9,000 right? years yeah. ago. That's right. In China. In China, there's a dig site in China and uh, McGovern out of uh, UPenn, who's an archeologist that studies the history of, of uh, alcoholic beverages. Um, God, what a job, what a job. It's almost yeah. as ours. So there are some <laughs> residues that you can pull out with a mass spectrometer that are only derived by the fermentation of honey or the fermentation of fructose or the fermentation of other sugars. And so he was able to uh, determine that 9,000 years ago at this dig site, 
there was fermented honey. And the story seems quite plausible that uh, a hunter-gatherer collected some honey and had it in, in a in pouch or whatever. And it, yep. and it got wet. It got rained on. Well, they were out hunting. Well, maybe they're out hunting. Yeah, that's and, my uh, story. They were, okay. they were out hunting. <laughs> and they got back, and their honey was, was, was dripping. It was all wet. And it was starting to, like, foam and smell kind of funky. But they can't. They're like, it's good food. They're like, it's I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to throw that away. It's right. very, they got stung by bees getting that honey yeah. and, and everything. So they they waited, they tasted it. It still tasted pretty good. And then a week or two later they tasted some and it felt pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> there was some alcohol in there. Let's, and they thought to themselves, let's leave wow, that honey we out should more we should do that again. That's, right. <laughs> That's exactly what I think happened. Yeah. yeah. It makes See. sense. Humans uh, are good that way. So we're gonna talk about the mead that we make. Oh, I better put some tree honey in here. This, oh no, we're, we're not gonna make it. This this is available here for sale in our shop. You got some more from him recently, right? So we, we did. Get, yes. It's a new a bigger jar, so you get even more now. Yep, we have so, um, a couple different sizes. We have a good. size half and a and a full one that, that like this. And in our in our deli, we buy a giant one. Yeah. And then I get five gallon pails of yeah, it from Troy. It's so good. So I'm going to check in with the audience, and then we're going to go. We're going to get our tasting started. We, we're, have you done any tastings with this? Because no, but because I think the smoked cheese overpowers this. But the brie is really nice. Well, we the, haven't even the done the honey. tasting, so I haven't jumped into that yet. But you're well, you've been talking, you're so, a so, I'm in, so I've been, you know, <laughs> I gotta catch up. Well, uh, no, I'm catching up audience. with your deep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, just just to see if anybody else has shown up, uh, Douglas Peterson is from Worcester. That's great. Excellent. And. Um, and he's right. Oh, there he is. Oh, there he is. We have a live All audience right, today. So the live folks. audience is awesome. chiming in. There it is. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for joining us online and in the present. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Gar oh, oh, Matt says that the uh, Red Scare is an aphrodisiac. Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> I don't want to don't, don't, don't that. Need to elaborate we'll talk about on that. that later. <laughs> and uh, Gary Parker says cranberry growers use bees all the time. That makes sense. Absolutely. And, uh, Matt, in, in there, uh, is their honey unique? Do they market it? Yes, they do. Right they, do they do market it, Matt. Um, it's sold at uh, various uh, health food stores and specialty markets in our state. I suspect it even makes its way down your way in Massachusetts, maybe over into Vermont. Um, so I would look for that. And Matt asked if Troy would make a hive available to, a, to an area down there. And exactly that. Troy actually supplies queen bees, right? Yes, he's a, he is a big He helps queen set up hives. Bee. He does, absolutely. He's yeah. one of the real champions of native New Hampshire queen bees. Most of the honeybees in these northern climates have a lot of trouble surviving the winter. And people bring in bees from the south, like Georgia or South Carolina, and including the queens. And the queens are not used to the environment, the bees are not used to the environment, and they struggle with, with mites and pests and the right. cold, and they don't typically survive. Troy has been working for years in developing native bees that do really well surviving our winters. And he supplies them to local and he supplies apiaries. Them. He raises so, queens that he sells. Matt, if you have somebody that's interested in talking to Troy, get him in touch with us and we'll connect the dots. We'll connect to Troy. I'm sure Troy, Absolutely. he's a super nice guy. If, oh yeah, he's fantastic. He will do what he can to help, I guarantee it. And, uh, and one last, before we get on, uh, Anne wants to say hi. She's uh, she's excited about our new live audience. All right, Good excellent. You, and so uh, let's get back to the tasting. We have three wines to taste, which uh, if, with all the gathering we're we still do, working on we'll, one of them. We'll be lucky to get through. So before we to go any further, let's just go through just some of the basics of tastings because there sure. may be some new folks here. Yeah. Granted, m most of you are, are well experienced at this, but in case there's somebody watching who's not done this before. So swirling the wine, that's the first thing that you want to make sure that you do when you're tasting a, a wine. The purpose for I that is these glasses. <laughs> There's a number of reasons that we swirl our wine. The the the, the most important is you it looks like to, you know what you're you doing. Look like you know what you're doing exactly. <laughs> you're catching on. So uh, you can hold it like this too. Well, that's if you're really a you know a 
really pro, super wine pro. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and you can so, just talk. You know what that is, though? That's about it's about heat distribution. If you yes. hold a wine like this, yeah, you warm it up. You deliver heat to the wine. Right. If you hold it here, you will deliver heat. That's slowly what the stem is all wine. about, right? right? Besides the aesthetic of the, right. of the shape, but it is about separating the heat from your hand from the wine. And if you hold it down here, there'll be no delivery of heat to the wine, right? right? So you just take some practice with this. Do this at home before you do it in public because it could be messy. And then uh, you, the real reason you swirl a wine is when you swirl a wine, you you increase the surface area of the the wine on the glass, which means there's more volatile uh, activity going from the surface into the glass, it, uh, bringing the aroma into the into the globe mm. of the glass, and that's important because your nose is over half your taste buds. So swirl and smell, and then as you're smelling, take some time with it and try and identify the the the, the knows the smell what are those things that you're smelling and don't worry about what the professionals say just worry about what yeah. you say what are those smells all the professionals are just people that have been doing this longer they've been doing it longer so maybe they're a little better at they, they're, they're better at yeah. coming up with the words but really only it matters what you say and the more you do this you'll probably start saying some of the same things the professionals say so uh swirl it and smell it take a moment come up with some names and then when you put the wine in your mouth don't swallow it put it in your mouth and chew it You want to chew the wine because you want to expose your whole mouth to the to the wine. You want to get your all of your your uh, taste buds involved. You want to understand the mouth feel. You don't want to just let it go go down and disappear down your throat. Yeah. Then after you've done that, think about some of those those identities that you came up with during the smell and see if they connect dots. See if you can actually taste some of those things. And and maybe you'll put some names to some additional flavors that you discover when you put it in your mouth. And lastly, after you've swallowed the wine, breathe in through your mouth and exhale through your nose. And you'll send the wine, the aromas of the wine, up the backside of your nose where you'll perceive smell just a little bit differently. And don't worry if you don't get that on the first time. It's not easy. It's very subtle. Um, but with practice, you will start to notice you get different smells on the backside. It's, is, it's incredibly powerful. The, that retronasal approach for me is how... Um, little subtleties or in the case of some of them, if there's, if there's a flaw or an issue with the wine, it You'll really it shows up that way through the retro nasal. Yeah. yeah. Take the time with every bottle of wine that you open, take the five minutes it takes to go through that exercise. If you do, you will become better at tasting yeah. wines. You will become better at identifying those wines that you like and don't like. And you will get better at picking wines out in the supermarket or at the wine store that actually are going to go home and be enjoyed. Yeah. Um, if you if you don't learn about the wines and understand what it is you like and don't like about wines, it's going to be really hard to fi figure out what your next wine is going to be. I think that's important, and you know you've told that story and that approach to a lot of people that come and taste wine at our shop here because people come in and. As, a, as someone who travels around and goes wine tasting, you get kind of uh, overwhelmed. Your, your senses are taking in everything around you, the music you're listening to, the environment that you're in, the, the rapport that's going on with the person that's serving you, and that can distract you from what's actually happening. Right. And then you toss it back and you write down a little score or whatever. You, you get to the end of your thing and you go, oh yeah, I kind of like that one. And you buy a bottle and you go home and then you're like, why did I buy this? Right. This is not. I it. hate when that happens. And 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 so you, you know, you are really good at at getting people to focus on their wine just for a moment, to really understand what it brings to their their palate, their enjoyment. They can personally then clearly decide, separate from all the other influence, whether or not that's a wine that they enjoy. And I think that's really really important because it's. It is extremely subjective and heavily influenced by everything around you. Right. And it's and it's hard to separate it right from that. No, from those influences. It's that's absolutely true. And I'm you know, as an early wine taster, that happened to me a lot. We you know, we'd be at our third or fourth wine tasting of the day. Oh, and, and you're just, buying wine. Oh, yeah, I'm wine. getting a bottle this of that. Be great. That's a good price. I'll get a yeah. six, six six pack of that. You get it home, and you know, a month <laughs> later and you're having like, a dinner and you're like why did I buy that? Why did I choose that wine? <laughs> that doesn't happen anymore. I don't let that happen because yeah. I know enough about it what takes, I like. It and takes don't practice. Like. It takes practice, and it's um, it is amazing how different wines can taste in different environments. 
you know, and we talk a lot about that. You know, the the, the, the number one question I, question I get when I'm doing a tasting is, what's your favorite wine? And right. my number one answer is always, it's the one in one my glass. glass. Yeah. And the lesson there is, is that it, every wine is going to offer a different experience for a different reason, and you're going to choose a different wine for a different reason. And sometimes you may choose a beer, or you may choose a spirit. <laughs> Who knows? It's, it depends on the mood. It depends on the weather. So your, on, your mood must change every night because you go from beer to wine it to changes spirit. Mood. Yes, of course. Right? It's an so evolution. It's, there you go. I never want to go to, go go up to up just to stay all with beer a, with, a, with a glass of wine. I always go up with a whiskey. That's yeah. that's something nice about sipping a. A oh, nice, yeah. Oh, slow, yeah. There's a certain whiskey yeah. right oh, before yeah. bed. That's a great, so yeah, it's a transitionary period. It's another moment, another time, another experience. Yep. You need something else. Yeah. It's different. All yeah, the on the boat, you're not, you know, crushing a whiskey. No, God, no. <laughs> that would be a horrible experience. No, you've got a can of cider. It's like a can of cider yeah, or, can of or cider, dodo yeah, or something. There you go, exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah. so, all right. So, so, what do you think on the, on the pairing? So, you haven't touched your food at all. No. So and first of all, I'm going to talk. About, let's talk about the wine okay, before we get sure. into the pairing. All right, I'll you're pour going to need more. to pour some more. <laughs> Daryl, and there's definitely not going to be any three honey. Don't worry, I'll, I'll bring you I a bottle. I actually haven't had three honey in a while. I know you're really, enjoying it. I'm really see. enjoying it. Yeah, I love this wine. So what I love about the three honey is, first of all, if if you want to talk about a honey wine, this is a honey wine. It's the, the nose is all about the honey. I everything I get in here is just yeah. this. It's just honey. It's beautiful honey. And I, I really do like that because I'm becoming a bigger and bigger fan of honey. So it's nice. Yeah, to I remember actually very early in 2010 or 2011, we were first starting our winery and I wanted to make mead. And you're like, no, nah, you know, I was still buying not, not honey in the bear. You know, you're not, <laughs> you just weren't that keen on it. I'm like, no, Bob, we really need to make some mead. At least, yeah. at least, you know, one or two meads. And we made this three honey wine right out of that. And, um, it's a good thing that we did that because it's Gerilyn's favorite. I know. And, you know, she lets you keep right doing now. this yeah. stuff. So. She's worked hard for us over the years. Yeah. She yes, absolutely. Three Honey Wine absolutely. has, uh, has yeah. always been at the end of the, the, the rainbow right. there. So this is um, this is a, a show mead. It's um, just honey, water, and yeast that go into creating this beverage. So there are no other additives or variations so you're getting the true expression of of the honey and, and ferment uh process that comes out and this particular wine our three honey wine we focus on getting honey from troy that has been uh from early season flowers so these are the blossoms from trees um, that are early in the season and early season honey is very light and very floral and that's what we use for this uh, mead for the other meads that we'll talk about today, it's a later season yep. honey, which is different. So, What's your favorite on the cheese? On the flavor, it's really light. And wow, I just had an interesting experience. Uh, we always talk about this going well with a creamy, creamier cheese. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think it goes better with a goat cheese. We don't have a goat cheese here on the plate. But I tried it with the brie, and I thought it was too much. The brie was too much. Yeah. It, it buried the honey. The brie stood out too strong. But then I just had a little cheddar with it. Well, I haven't which, cheddar with cheddar. Which I would have thought would have been too, too strong much. for it. Mm -hmm. But there was something that I enjoyed. Try it. I don't. I, oh, maybe it's, a, it's an anomaly. I better have some more before it's all gone. <laughs> so I tried the cheddar with it. Um, I, I tried the, uh, you said the smoked didn't work. No, I'm it's gonna, too strong. I'm, I'm going to agree that that's probably, I'm not even going to try that. I'm going to save that one because I think that'll go with it later. And on. don't go the blue cheese. And don't do well, and that's, again, now I think the cheese would overpower it, but let's try the, uh, the creamy cheese. I just the, tried uh, that. This is such a delicate wine. I do like the cheddar with it, Bob. You're right. It's something weird I about that. I thought for sure that would be sure way too work. much, yeah. but it, it, it works. And actually, the cream cheese, as long as you don't get too much of the fruit. Too much of the sauce. Too yeah, much I, got, of the fruit. I got quite a bit of sauce, and it was just too much, too many spices. But just the cream of the cheese really is the not. The creme fraiche. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's why goat cheeses. I've had the three honey with goat cheese. With it works. It really goes well with the goat cheese or, or something of that nature. Mm. Um, softer, lighter cheeses. Mm. Um, I don't, I'm not even going to try it with the blueberry cheese. Well, maybe I will. It's not bad. I think. Well, it's got some cheddar in it. That's why. Right. Right. And we have made a, a blue mead where we where we use blueberries with the honey, and that's a delightful 
Blend. I think the cheddar was better. The cheddar was the best. Than the, than the, that was the best. Yeah. And, and the creamy cheese without the, the sauce, which I think is the, is the cherry. Mm -hmm. It's the cherry straw sauce from Waz. By the way, all of these cheeses are available in our, in our deli. They're all locally sourced. They're coming from Vermont and, and New Hampshire. And, and Waz produces our sauce. We've talked yeah. about this before. We have some really great local producers of, of foods and meats and cheeses. And I so love that we get to share them here with. I mean, that's really it. It sticks with that, with the recognition that the best flavors, best beverages, best foods come within a short distance of where they're created. Yeah, and and that's really where key. The and that's part of why you travel and 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 interact with those environments. And we try to do that every day here at at, at Hermit Woods to have good quality products. Did you try with so me? I did not. Oh, I need a little more, sorry. No. Well, I think the meat's a little strong. I bet it is. A little strong, yeah. It comes through in the end. You know, it sometimes... It sort of buries the, the meat behind it. Sometimes a beverage, although the pairing may not be enhancing to the, to the beverage, it can still be enhancing to the experience. I'll drink this with a, with a spicy green curry, and it's fantastic. And it buries the wine, but the wine softens somehow the, softens the curry or just softens works the spice. really well. I like to chill it down. It's something about that, the, the, the coconut and the spice and the character in that green curry goes really well with the three honey. Mm. It takes experimentation. And if you, if you open your mind up and, and take the time no, to dig in a little me. bit, mm. you, will, you will find the, the matches that work for you. Yeah, it's right. going to be different right. for everybody. Right. And don't, don't, again, don't go by the rules. Go by what feels good in the mouth. And, and what you want to be looking for is if the flavor just buries the wine. So you, when, you, when the, the, the remaining flavor in your mouth is, is not the wine, it's the food, then maybe it's not the right pairing. And vice versa, if the remaining flavor is just wine and you don't even sense the taste of the food anymore, then your wine buried the food and maybe that's right. not a good pairing. Right. But when the two come together, and maybe that's not only magical. come together, but create something new that is a, a even more special. That's flavor. the best. Before we go to the next one, you just poured. Let's check back with uh, our audience. Okay, you questions. check with the audience here. I'm gonna, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna stick my nose in the glass. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh. So Lynn says we had three honey with feta basil uh, quiche Sunday. Uh, oh, perfect. That sounds actually good. Ah, and she's gonna try it with cheddar now. That's a good with idea. The, with the honeycomb. Excellent. Yeah, with honeycomb with cheddar. There you go. I bet the I feta would go. I bet the feta would be really good with the three honey, just like you I said with that goat so. cheese. It's, it's a soft that cheese. Tang. Yeah. It's a soft cheese with that tanginess. Uh, Matt says a very old scotch follows me nicely. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to explore that together, Matt. I look forward to it. Hey, Matt, <laughs> what about a distilled mead that's barrel aged? <laughs> Gerilyn, yes. <laughs> she don't, needs don't 300. What's with these little tiny bottles, she says. They're perfect. You know, <laughs> I, I, I love these things because they fit in a glass. You just open it up yeah. and pour the whole thing into a glass. And we used to do perfect. 300 in a 750. We did. Yeah. Yes. She's, she's lamenting the days. And uh, Matt says, honeycomb being, being heartier can hold its own with Dubliner. Dubliner. Yeah. No, what is the Dubliner? Yes, the Dubliner. Dubliner. What is that? Well, I assume he'll Matt explain in a moment. He will tell us in a moment. He wants to know if we should buy a little still. We shouldn't talk about that, Matt. Yeah, no, we're not talking about that, Matt. Moving right along to... Bob kicked me underneath the counter here, <laughs> Matt, just so you know for mentioning that. <laughs> what are we drinking now? Well, this, uh, this has quite a different color to it. It's uh, much more golden in color. It's a darker colored mead, but it is also a, a show mead, which is uh, not anything but the honey with the water and, and yeast. But this has been um, All kinds of things a special on. combination here on, on, on the two main fronts. The honey, uh, which was from, from Troy's uh, apiary, there is a plant that grows in New Hampshire. It's an invasive plant called Japanese knotweed. It looks a bit like bamboo, grows all over the place. You can't kill the damn stuff. 
it uh, grows, you hack it down, it grows again. It's, it's everywhere. You can bury it under plastic mats. It pushes up through the plastic mats. You can spray it with Roundup. It's just you sort of laughs. It. it kind of crumples down and then it grows again. You you know, it. It's incredible stuff. Yeah. Anyway, Japanese knotweed um, puts out these, these complex white fronds of flowers late August. Right about now, they're just starting to flower. And bees, pollinators love it. I mean, it's just a, a flower that they, they love. There are certain flowers that, that pollinators really go for. And this is one of them. And so the nectar that they take from Japanese knotweed and bring back to the hive and put up as honey looks like molasses. It's really dark and it has this tangy, burnt candy sort of caramel. character to it. Caramel. Yeah. yeah it's, it's amazing. Really awesome stuff. If you get to find a, a there are a few people in, in Troy, New England. Troy sometimes will have sell specific it, yeah. jars with the dark honey. And there are some it. farmers markets I've heard that sell a knotweed up. honey. And if you find it, buy as much as they'll sell you yeah. or you can great afford because it's really great. That's great stuff. So this mead called Knot Sap Mead, K-N-O-T, is made exclusively from Japanese knotweed honey. So I get this really dark honey from Troy. But instead of water, I use sap out of a sugar maple tree. And it's basically it's water. It's mostly water. Yeah, it's With basically some different water. In it and different In the spring, when the, the days are getting longer, the trees that have all, you know, sort of dehydrated themselves and they, they're plumping back up. They're pulling up water out of the, out of the ground, up into their foliage, into their buds, getting ready to, to open up. And you can drill a hole through the bark and tap that sap. We did this for many years in my yard. Had yep. plenty of good scotch out cooking sap. That's where Hermit yeah. Woods was born. That's where it was born. Out yeah. there on the, on the That's fire. another story. We should yeah. do a scotch night. Ooh, we can't really do that here. We can't be careful about that. We're leaning that way again. Um, so anyway, this wine, instead of using water, like we do in the Three Honey and most of the other meads, we use 100% uh, maple sap from a sugar maple tree. Those are blended together and fermented. And so it creates this really unique product. It was um, aged in French oak wine barrels as well. For a better and part then, of a year, right? Yeah, and then finished dry. So again, it's a, it's a dry, complex mead. It's got so much going there's on. A, there's a lot going on in this. You smell the nose on this. I mean, you, you definitely get the honey. There's no doubt. There's, there's a but nice, you get some of that oak good character that goes on. I think this this was actually fermented in the oak barrel. You get too. some spice, which maybe is coming yeah. from the oak. I really like the nose on this. I love this wine. It's really this complex. Is such a nice wine. And then the taste. And this is aged out beautifully. This was made in 2016. We still have a few bottles left. It's it's softening. It's rounding. Yeah. Some of that uh, some of that that uh, citric is kind of softening. The a bit. citric is is really subdued it's now compared to what it was a couple of years yeah, ago. It's still there. Actually, I was tasting with somebody at the tasting bar, and the first thing they said after tasting is citrus. Citric. And I yeah. said, "That's it. You you yeah. nailed it." But it's it's a, a lot more subtle than it was when you first. Put I it get in the, the oak. It's kind of a soft oakiness on the retronasal. Yeah. a lot. Ooh, that just as you said that, I was. I was in, you know, whatever talking I was doing, I could get that hint on the back of my nose, and I got that hint of no, of oak, just as you said. I'm going to try that with the smoked cheddar. So I tried it with the cheddar, and actually, the smoke. I bet it's going to go with the smoked cheddar because it was more powerful than the than the cheddar. Mm -hmm. the, the, there's so much going on here. It was right. it was still a good pairing, but it but the the, oh, the yeah. cheddar dominated the three honey. This dominates the cheddar. So let's see if the smoked. This is a cheese wine, and this will take any of this, I bet. Maybe even the blue cheese. Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, the smokiness, oh, yeah. and, the, and this wine yeah. is perfect together. And again, both the cheese and the wine flavors improve when the two get right. into your mouth. Right. It's brilliant. I'm going to remember that. Mm. Mm. How about the blue cheese? Ooh, that's, that's daring. <laughs> I've never seen blue cheese done in a thin slice like this. It's really fascinating. Yeah, it's almost too thin to get a piece off the plate. Mm. 
I'm not a fan. Blue cheese is too much. Oh, no, it's all wrong. It's like the wrong kind of tanginess. There's a yeah. tanginess to the blue cheese, yeah. and there's a tanginess to the citrusy but here. All I got in my mouth and they, is they don't work. Over. I it's just conflict. Get rid of the blue cheese. Yeah. Just conflict. Mm. Yeah, this is a fascinating, well, how about the, fascinating one. The, the meat. That might work. Oh, the meat has some honey on it. I didn't see that before. Did you see that? Some honey on the meat, on the prosciutto. Oh, really? Oh, mm. Oh, you're right. Mm. Oh, mm, Stephanie must have done that. That's a nice touch. Very different from the experience with three honey. This wine with a little honey and prosciutto, brilliant. I think it goes perfect. I like it a lot. Oh yeah, it's perfect. They don't uh, conflict at all. No. I get. There's not like a new synergy that comes out. Both of them shine at different points of time in my mouth as I'm as I'm chewing the meat, as I'm sipping the wine. Yep. Oh, it's really nice though. Mm. I like it. I mean, I could just I just keep wanting to go back for more more meat. More meat. More meat. More meat. <laughs> <laughs> it is quite amazing. What about the soft cheese? That might work. You know them. We could do like a five-hour thing on mead. It's such a nice, delightful. <laughs> uh oh, that didn't no, seem to work. No, no, it, it, it didn't have anything to do with that. I just I was trying to balance the chew in my mouth, and the mead slipped down my throat. But but, but it's no, it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. I don't, I don't find it at all. Try it. That was with the brie, right? The brie. I didn't find it worked with the brie at all. It's, the brie has a very different flavor. It needs something else. I don't know what it is right now. Rosé. It needs rosé. Mm. The brie... The brie is really nice on its own. It's really nice. <laughs> it's really nice. But it takes away from it wow. when you put the wine in it. It doesn't... It doesn't there's, there's like a... There's no marrying. There, 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 yeah, unless it's the rosé, right? We've had that with rosé. <laughs> That's what I said. Killer. I said, did, did, did you say, I just yeah. said that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that that was just an outstanding combination. <laughs> that was six months ago. You just said that? I just said that, yeah. <laughs> you can watch the recording. It, it, I know, you're recording it. That's good. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it doesn't go. And it doesn't go with this either. It's too sweet. The uh, the cream cheese and the, yeah. and the, the cherry... All right, let's bring on the red scare. Bring on the red scare. All right, while you're getting you that give it a ready, check with people. We got a new glass for that. Got a new glass. I'll check with people here. See, see where we're at. Greg has shown up. Excellent. Oh, Greg. Good to see you. Very old Scotch goes with everything. You know, he says that. But remember that dinner we had? We had a dinner at oh, that uh, pairing. At this, this, that was ridiculous. It was a steakhouse down on the seacoast, and uh. they, they got with Lafroig. And of course, when they said Lafroig dinner pairing, we went. We went. Of course, because <laughs> Lafroig is one of our favorites. We didn't Scotch. eat any of the food. So we had dinner paired with Lafroig. <laughs> no, uh, honestly, uh, I did not feel like any of it worked. I'm sorry. However. I love Lafroig right. and I love the food that I ate that night, but I did not find the two belonged in my mouth together. No. The only thing with, with Greg showing ever... up here is bacon, <laughs> smoky bacon <laughs> with scotch <laughs> is phenomenal. I have to, I have I was, to say. I was introduced that to did, that concept that by work. Greg. And very honestly, there might be some combinations of scotch and food that work well together. But the steakhouse was, I think they were just on the marketing thing. They wanted to get the Freud folks there. And and they did a great job. And it was a, it was a great experience. But... But honestly, I did not feel like Lafroig and steak. I wanted. I was just dying for a glass of wine that night. <laughs> Something to oh, go. Oh, I with. know. We all, you and Chuck and I, all three of us were like, just give me a glass of yeah, wine. We'll yeah, this is just Lafroig after. Right. <laughs> That's usually when I have it. So anyway, uh, well, we went. Thank you, Greg, for for spawning that little sidetrack. Mm. Uh, and Matt is pairing this with red apple smoked Gruyere. Oh. I started with the honeycomb, but this is better. Okay. And Lynn says, Matthew followed with the Lavignon 20. Oh, 
It's Lagavulin marvelous. 21, his smile is priceless. Oh, Lagavulin yes. 21. Wow. I haven't had the 21. Oh, I can't even imagine. Well, you, I mean, I drink the 16. That's I'm it, dedicated that ashy to the 16. Yeah. 16, I, I really love, but I've never had the 21. Well, and, and this is interesting. They always say that Americans, Americans salivate over age. Uh, when when the when the Scottish they they look at Americans with their their obsession with it's got to be older if yeah. it's older it's better oh no there's some eights it's, and tens and, there's some eights yeah. and tens that are fantastic the so Freud ten is unbelievable the Freud ten is good good thing because their eighteen is no longer available oh so that yeah, was that was a travesty that was, that was a travesty when that would just disappear it's like are you kidding me mm -hmm. and Matt says Brie and cognac oh. Gary says, the Red Scare, is that a new vintage? Okay, well, so we're going to talk about that in a second. So wait a minute. Greg says, Scotch Night, how about sometime in October? Maybe after work. Absolutely. Just <laughs> yes, that's a, that's a definite, that's a definite Greg. Yes. You can count on it. For sure. Yes. And uh, so that's, that's good. We checked in. Good. Back to the, uh, back to the tasting. You got the Red Scare in the glass. Mm. Let's go with mm. this. So Red Scare, this is. This See you is all later. <laughs> Sorry. I'm gone. See you, Ken. Yeah. It's, it's nice enjoying wine with you. So this is, uh, seriously, this I is this probably wine. of all the wines that we produce is the one that gets us probably the most excited because of the, the, the all that went into making it, its history, its backstory, its name, its its connection with your farm and your and your beehives and your yeah. son and your family yeah. and your and your property and all the fruit on your property. I mean, there's just the depth of the story that goes into this. I was talking to yeah. somebody today about a, a new person coming on board with us, talking about. I was saying how you know as you as you develop as a wine taster here at wine at the winery, you'll develop your own stories. Right. And and I said, and and then you'll sh you'll you'll do a tasting with me, and I have fifty stories to tell about every <laughs> one of the wines that we right. have, and I probably have a hundred right. stories to tell right. about <laughs> Red Scare. I'm so glad that this has become one of our prominent wines at the winery, that we have it in 750 milliliter burgundy bottles. And it's a product that we can keep producing and people get turned on about. And it's a mead. It's, I think it's, it's because it doesn't drink like a mead. It just slips under. Well, you kind of even know, don't talk about it like a it, mead. It, it, it's, it's not, it, and, and you probably shouldn't because it doesn't drink like a mead. It, it drinks like a burgundy, like, like a red wine, like a, like a Pinot based or a Grenache based red wine. It's um, complex, it's Gamay. silky, it's Gamay, yeah. It's, uh, it's got this really nice red wine profile to it, um, but it is technically a mead where half of the fermentable sugars are honey. And you do get the honey. It's, it's dark There's berries. There's no denying, you get the honey on it. Yeah. This, every vintage is a little different, mm -hmm. of course, as I continue to weave my way through all of this. Um, uh, right now, I have the 21 vintage, one part of the 21 vintage of Red Scare fermenting downstairs right now. It's the blueberry and raspberry portion and sugar portion that are fermenting right now. And a month from now or so, the blackberry and honey portion of it. So this is blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, and honey, and a little sugar, and some water that are all fermented together. And um, fermented dry, and then barrel aged in French oak. And the backstory for Roughly those of 12 you- 12 months in the-, in the Yeah, it's, it, it varies from nine months to 18 months. Yep. So it's been, it's been a range, all barrels behave a little differently. And for the past three vintages, sort of following some of the Chateauneuf approach in Provence of keeping a portion of the wine in stainless steel its whole life to keep that bright, fresh fruitiness. And then a larger portion of it in barrel, which gives this structure and the smoothness and the, the oak component. So have you divided it out this year that way? I do it every year. So the last three vintages have been done okay. like that. Um, so this is the 2018 vintage that we're drinking right now. And um, get lots of uh, fresh berry kind of nose. Yeah. Um, I, I can't, I'm not good enough at labeling to pick those berries out specifically, but I, 
I, if you were to name them, I would, I would, I would dial yeah, right in on it. Yeah, it's part of it's, it's part it's, of that blend philosophy of when um, more than the sum of its parts. Right when um, Joe uh, was here um, Joe talking Fiola, about yeah. uh, fruit and blending, and this is and I've and I've created this in different ways where I've pushed one fruit one way or the other in a blend and then put them together. This blend is the way I like it. It's about equal parts blackberry and blueberry um, and a much smaller percentage of raspberry, primarily black raspberries. And then um, a good portion of, of honey that we're going to have uh, 1,200 pounds of honey go into the new batch of, of three honey. And, and 1,200 two, pounds just? 1,200 pounds of honey, 200 pounds of sugar. That's the ratio. So for it's Red a, Scare. For Red Scare. So it's a very small touch. I found so why that, do you need sugar? Because you because because the honey sugar. was a little bit too much honey note in the wine for me. So this this to me is a is a a, a beautiful version of Red Scare, but the honey is a little bit forward on the aroma. It's a little bit mm. too much. So wow. the so the nineteen the, I got the nineteen honey. that I just bottled, I pushed it back a little bit. In the 18 here, I think this may have been all honey. Or maybe this is the first vintage with a little bit of sugar. Anyway, um, it's, it's, that, it's that balance where you, where you find this synergy of parts where the new thing emerges. That, and, but, but being able to pick out honey, to me, goes, okay, that's not quite right. Too much. I don't want you to pick so that's out the, honey. That's the interesting thing. I want you to just... Be overwhelmed by a wonderful sensation. So the sugars that you that you add don't add flavor or aroma. That's right. They add alcohol. That's it. Honey adds flavor right. and aromas and things like that. But the dextrose I use, um, glucose, just pure alcohol. glucose, is just alcohol. Yeah. And that was from experimenting with making little batches of just right. sugar wines and finding that that dextrose ferments completely cleanly to ethanol. Right. It's like a watered-down vodka. Right. Yeah. So, so on, the, on the nose, we get a little honey on this one. This is more strongly honey than... than Less honey future. than the 17. Yep. Lots of berry. But on the, on the taste... It's got some high... A little bit of high acidity, which... Is, is so wonderful to, to watch as it ages because that there's a, a sharp, a little bit of sharpness to this as it's young. It's young. But five Absolutely. or 10 years from now. Absolutely right. That sharpness rounds out and it's so soft and, and it's, it's, it becomes a new, this is of all of the wines you have, this one I think ages the best. You, yeah. So far we've been yeah. 10 years out on this and yeah. it just keeps this, getting these, better. Red Scare, I need to put like 10 cases away. Yeah, remember that dish. tasting we did? We, we we had some a bunch of folks come, club members come and sign up for this. Oh, for this, the Red uh, Scare tasting, the Red Scare vertical flight, and we brought in a and couple we brought in some some burgundies, burgundies and and oh, Red Scare won hands down yeah. over the day. The, yeah. the aged Red Scare because we we had a flight, so it was, we right. had some some six or seven eight year old yeah. Red Scares served that night, and they were brilliant. And compared to some of and them, those Red Scares don't have nearly the structure or complexity right. no, that, I can't that these have. I, I can't why wait for these are 10 years old. Our best wines are going to be drank when we're dead because <laughs> they're, they're, they're going to have to age. Actually, this is very nutritious. <laughs> this is going to keep us alive Excellent. a lot we'll longer. We'll be alive a lot longer. Yeah. So let's try some with food. And, and I already did. The, uh, the, the cheddar it goes well with the cheddar, but believe it or not, the uh, blueberry cheddar, this is actually a really nice pairing. It is nice. I, I just had a piece of that, and there's a tanginess to the blueberry, which works with the bright acidity of, of the wine. Yeah. So this is the real Absolutely. test, because this hasn't tasted good with anything we've had tonight, the brie. Well, I disagree a little bit, because I did, did you find the brie? I, I did like the brie with the three honey. You didn't. I didn't. Okay. It, it, was, it was strong. It overpowered it, but I liked it with it. You do the brie. I'm doing the blue cheese. What do you think? No, nope. doesn't work. Doesn't work. It's too competing. The flavors are too different for me. I don't, it's the same problem I have with the three honey. That's weird. I thought it was going to go better with this because there's a little more acidity in this. 
But uh, try the blue cheese. This is kind of, I think it's weird, but it's good at the same time. <laughs> weird is all right. So a little backstory here, blue cheese. For those of you who haven't made, maybe not heard the story behind Red Scare, the name and the, and the format. The first vintage of this was done in 2008. Let's go to the blue cheese. Well before. Isn't that cool? Yeah. It's got this little spicy, like weird funk yeah. that goes on on the back end, yeah. especially. Sorry to interrupt. So um, the first vintage of Red Scare, an entire five gallons of it, <laughs> was uh, crafted in my backyard well before the, the winery was. Uh, what do you say? You're going to go out in your backyard and you're going to collect all the red berries and the honey from your hives. So it was, it was that. It was a, a foraging component. Um, what's interesting, I've been harvesting blackberries off these same canes in my yard this last two weeks. So they're all ripe right now. Blackberries go through an incredible transformation over a period of about 48 hours. They turn dark purple and they're not ripe. And you go to pick them and they look like a perfect blackberry that you want to pick and eat but you have to pull it off the vine. And when you bite it, it's very acidic, very bright, not that interesting. If you wait 12 hours or 16 hours and you go back to that same purple blackberry and you feel it, now it's soft. And it's hard to get it off without breaking the skin of the little bubbles. Of I've the had that experience, I know exactly what you're talking and about. It almost falls off. Yep. When I reach in on really ripe blackberries, the best ones drop and I don't get them. So I go in with my hand underneath the few blackberries I want to pick, and I start to reach out, and sure enough, one will drop in. And the flavor of that blackberry is unbelievable. It's fantastic. And one of these years, I'm going to go out and collect enough of those perfect blackberries to craft a, a wine out of it. But anyway, it's the first vintage of this in 08 was blackberries harvested this way off the canes over a period of three or four weeks, picking those perfect ripe ones, freezing them as soon as I got them. Black raspberries, which have moved around my yard a couple of different places, picking those same way, making sure they're perfectly ripe. And blueberries, we have some high bush blueberries in our backyard. Not as good as the wild blueberries, but still a good, good berry for sure. And honey from the beehives that Max, my son, set up when he was in high school. And in 08, he was in college, his freshman year in college, and uh, playing on an ultimate Frisbee team called Red Scare at Hampshire <laughs> College in, in Western Massachusetts. And um, I took these dark berries and honey from the beehives that he set up, uh, no sugar added, it was a pure honey mm -hmm. uh, berry format, and loved the product and called it Red Scare. And um, made it in 09 and 2010, and we became a winery in 2010 so I sent the formula to the federal government. I want to get approval for a wine called Red Scare. And um, they approved it, fortunately. Thank goodness. I signed it McCarthy, just to <laughs> mess with <it. laughs> uh -oh. No, I didn't. No <laughs> politics in the winery. <laughs> no, no politics, yes, that's right. <laughs> Best tasting room in the country, so no, no politics. We don't talk about politics, right. But that's how it got started. and. Um, it, uh, we made it at various scales with different sorts of formats. I couldn't get black raspberries in any large volume, so it was made with red raspberries commercially here for the first four the years. And then the black raspberries showed up in 2017. That was the first vintage. Um, 2016 was a hiatus for a bunch of our dark ferments. It was a difficult time for us, so we didn't make Hermitage. We didn't make... Red Scare, That's amazing. we didn't make Lake that. House Red. It was like, I don't what know what we, we were thinking. thinking. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't. But it came to pass. Well, we were trying to prevent bankruptcy, I think. I think that's what it was, <laughs> yeah. was trying to stay in business. <laughs> so that's it. And it's, uh, it's, it's, I really love the fact that we've, um, since 17, that we came back out with this, we... Um, have released it in a 750 milliliter bottle and it's become a very popular wine. And you know what? Um, I went through most of the yeah. things on my plate. This this goes with a lot of them. It does. It it's really just, it's a bold wine. It's, a bold it's, it's wine. you know. Yeah. It went really well with the meat. I, I like the meat with it a lot. Yeah. yeah. A little honey on it too. That's I know. Nice. It's I like that. That's perfect. <laughs> Stephanie's rocking it. So, well, guess what? We're 
we're past our hour. <laughs> as we, we still as have we half do. a bottle. I know. Well, tune in, folks. We will be uh, enjoying that half a bottle well after this broadcast is over. So let's see who's uh, any other comments before we sign off. Uh, let's see. Matt says, I buy. I always am nervous about hitting the mat going live with him because I never know what he's going to say. I know? buy Irish peat to burn <laughs> whilst I enjoy it. <laughs> love it though i have to just hit it he is an amazing person <laughs> amazing he has a few rare scotches okay so so gregory has something to say ken do the individual properties of the different honey show up findable zero mead skills here yes that's a good question greg and um individual honeys bring out unique flavors um the japanese knotweed honey that varietal creates a very citrusy sort of format to the mead. There is a yellow poplar tree in my backyard, a tulip tree. Mm -hmm. It's about 80 years old and this gigantic Some great honey tree. And when that was when that's in bloom, you can stand underneath it and just hear the <laughs> pollinators buzzing around up in this tree. I've heard that before. And one year, I think it was 2011 or 2010, no, it was a 09, it was a 09. Um, I put a honey super empty box of, of slats on the hive, knowing that the bees were going directly to that poplar and they filled the whole super with honey. And when I pulled out the frames, you know, when a, when a beehive, when bees fill up their honeycomb with, with honey, they cap it with a thin capping of wax. And then that stores, that's their food. They've stored it for the winter. Well, I stole their food. I took that honey super off and I pulled out the frames to uncap it and extract the honey. And the color of it was a light violet color. It was purplish. Hmm. And it turns out that poplar wood, when you slice it sometimes, will have a purple streak. Hmm through the wood. It just blows my mind. I don't know what that, where that color comes from. But anyway, I, I, I uncapped this honey and drained out the honey, spun it to, yep. to extract it, and it was clear, crystal clear honey, and made a mead. And Chuck will remember this mead. And I called it poplar mead. And it was this delightful, varietal and I do not have the words to describe it. It had a very unique flavor. There are many people that that um, in the mead forums that I uh, operate in and talk to and follow, um, people talk about varietal honeys all the time and what they bring to the glass. It's, it's very specific. It's probably along the lines to put it in the grape world between Merlot, Pinot Noir, Grenache, Cabernet, each one of those dark skinned grapes produces a red wine that have very distinctive characteristics. And these honeys are no different. They're, they provide that very unique, uh, different flavor profile to the glass, even though it's just honey and water that's fermented. Well, thank you, Greg, for asking that question because you, you drew out all kinds of interesting information from Ken from that answer. So thank you. That was that. fun. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're, uh, we're pushing 10 minutes past all our right. hour. So we, uh, again, want to thank everybody for coming out, for asking the questions you ask for, for being part of this presentation. And, uh, for all of those who, who, uh, didn't partake, we, we appreciate your, your, uh, your, your we should just ship, well, a, so. you know, wine to everybody that's going to join us here on these things. Shouldn't we do that? We should do that. We should do that. Just send Red Scare to everybody. Yeah, just send Red the Scare. Whole the whole world should drink Red Scare. The whole world should drink Red Scare. They should. So, they really so, should. On that note, <laughs> <laughs> stay tuned for your bottle of Red Scare. Bob's putting it in the I can't talk anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all again for joining us for another Monday. We had a lot of fun. Um, I have no Thank idea you. what we're doing next Monday. In fact, I think I'm doing it alone. I think you're gone next Monday, right? Oh, no. Really? Am yeah, I? No, possibly. I need to be here. I don't know. I have a lot going on. We'll, have, we'll figure this oh, no. out. I'm, I'm here. This, 
the next it's Monday? The Monday after. Oh, it's the Monday after. Okay, we'll figure that out. But it, uh, we we don't have a plan for next Monday. But of course, we we rarely have a plan, so we'll stay tuned. Except every third Monday, we do a wine tasting that'll be published on our right. site. So if you want to join us for that, you could get the wines in advance and join us for the tasting. And I hope you do. But uh, other than that, we're flying by the seat of our pants, right. and uh, we're having fun. I hope you're having fun with us. Thank you again for for uh, for being part of the experience. Thank you for voting for us, fourth best tasting room in America. Yeah. Can you believe it? No, I can't. So uh, the fourth part doesn't really matter. No, it's the it fact matter. that we're one of the we're top on the tasting list. rooms of USA matter, Today so. is fantastic. Thank you all. So thank you for voting. Really appreciate it. We uh, we'll see you again next Monday, five thirty. Hope you can join us.